Good morning, everyone. My name is Carrie Hoff, and I'm the youth minister here at Our Savior. I want to welcome all those gathered here in person here at our Tacoma campus, as well as those joining us online. We invite everyone to complete a connection card by either using your phone to scan the QR code that you see on the screen in front of you, or by going to go.oslc.com cc. If you're in person, you can grab a connection card from the pew in front of you, fill it out, and put it in the giving boxes in the back as you leave worship today. If this is your first time worshiping with us, let us know on your connection card or stop by the connection counter in the lobby after worship, because we have a gift for you. Here's what's happening in OSLC life. I want to invite you to join us for a very special guest speaker at church as Pastor Tim will have a conversation with Pastor Hisham Shahab, who will share his personal story of radical grace and unconditional forgiveness that will inspire you in surprising ways at both services on Sunday, January 22nd. Please invite a friend and join us for worship as we hear this unforgettable story of God's incredible mercy. As we get ready to enter our time of worship, I want to let you know that if you want more information on all other exciting ministries happening here at Our Savior, check out our central hub at oslc.com or download the OSLC app at oslc.com app. All right, let's stand wherever we are as we come into God's presence and begin our time of worship. Thank you, Carrie, who is uh, not around yet. They're still uh, paternity and paternity leave. And if you have not seen that baby, whoo, she is cute. She's <laughs> cute. But uh, I want to welcome everyone here. I'm Jared. I'm the worship arts director. And uh, I want to welcome everybody online. Hey, everybody. Glad you guys are here to join with us. Um, your host will take you through the service. If you want to pray, they'd love to pray with you. So uh, we are glad that we could all be gathered this morning. We're going to start. I'm going to read a scripture uh, from Ephesians 4. It says this, this is verses one uh, to five, six, actually, one to six. Um, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And as we begin today, we gather as one unified body with many different people. But it is the good news of Christ that unifies us, that we stand on today, amen? God has called each of us to gather around the table, no matter who we are or where we're from, the color of our skin, what our background is, how much money is in our bank account. No matter what we've done, our God calls us by name to be unified in him regardless of our past. And there is a seat for you, for me, for all at his table. And we celebrate that fact this morning as we begin our time in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're gonna teach you a new song. It's one of my favorites now. It's, uh, it's called Bigger Table. And um, the verses, I'll I'll be honest, uh, they're a little difficult to sing. You'll pick them up, but the chorus is pretty simple. And so join with us on the chorus that goes like this. A house for the hungry, a well for the thirsty. We're all saints, come together, shoulder to shoulder. Welcome for the trap. the fault lines in me time and time again and welcomes me in
we sit together at the table of Christ, invited by name, and he wants us to make room for everyone. Let's sing this. There's an empty seat waiting next to me. We gotta make some room for each other. Let my enemy be my family. Fill my cup till it's running over. Try that. There's an empty seat waiting next to me. We gotta make some room for each other. Let my from 1 John as we continue this morning. 1 John chapter 4, it says, loved ones, loved ones, that's you and me, loved ones, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and therefore they know God. And it continues, anyone who does not love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. Good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Tim. It's great to welcome you here. And that is the truth that we want to center on as we begin our worship today, that God is love. And we come before God uh, knowing that his love invites us, but also know where to find, uh, in a sense, the refill, the rejuvenation, the the energy to love others as God loves us. And we know that it's only in Jesus that we have that power. We call that the Holy Spirit. And we receive that love here in this meal that we call communion in Jesus' body and his blood. So let's bow our heads as we prepare our hearts to receive this meal this morning. Uh, we say, Heavenly Father, just in the silence of our own hearts, um, we acknowledge and we declare that you are love today, that your love invites us to your table, and that we, in and of ourselves, we are not worthy. We, we are not deserving to even approach this table without your grace. We hear those words that those who do not know God, we don't have that love. And we admit right now, there are times when in our thoughts and in our words and our actions, they, they, they tell the world, they tell ourselves that, man, we don't have a clue of who God is. That we have sinned in our thoughts, words, and actions. We cannot save ourselves. So we ask that you would forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we might have joy, so that we might know you more and more even as we experience your presence here in this meal. And so personally and silently, let's just reflect on, on the simplicity that God is love and God is here and that he forgives our sins. Let's do that.
If you read on in that section of 1 John chapter 4, it says, this is how you're going to know what love is. Not by an idea, not by reading it in a book, not by a philosophy that somebody's going to tell you or a system to live a better life, but by this, that you're going to see Jesus. That love is going to be made known to you when you see the Son of God, Jesus Christ himself, live and die and rise again. And that's the message that has been given to us. That's the message that we rejoice here, that the same Jesus who body and blood that we get to share in this meal, he has lived, he has died, he has risen, he has forgiven you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If you believe that, say amen. 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 So this meal is for us. Jesus, the night he was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples as he said, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. And then after supper, Jesus took the cup, and as he gave thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink of it, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood given for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. May God's peace be with you today. Thanks, you can be seated. We get to share communion by coming forward. We'll have four continuous lines going. And uh, if you're new here, welcome, welcome, welcome. Glad you are here. And as you come up, you know, know that this meal, it's, it is a, a sacred experience. It's a divine experience. And it's, it's for you. It's God's love for you. So as you come forward, you can hold out your hand to receive a piece of bread. All of our bread is gluten-free. And then the person with the tray, the outer ring of darker color cups, that's alcoholic wine. And then the inner color, lighter color cups, uh, that's non-alcoholic grape juice. And if you have questions as you're up here, I know it can be a little nerve-wracking, especially if this is your first time. Uh, just ask, all right? We're here to help and serve you, all right? If you're online, this is the time for communion and worship for you as well. Hey, you are invited to share into this moment when God meets us in these simple ways, all right? So I invite our servers to come forward as we continue worship here together, all right?
raises us from brokenness to everlasting life with him. And it is only through this blood, his blood that is shed on the cross that you and I can be assured of salvation. Amen? Amen. That's exciting. Let's sing this beautiful modern hymn that we love. We don't sing this song enough, but uh, in Christ alone, let's sing this.
Amen, Lord. We do stand in your power today, forgiven and renewed. We thank you for your love, God. Let's join together as we profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Now may the body and blood of your Savior Jesus keep you in both faith and in life, even until life everlasting. Go in his peace. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's go to God in prayer today. Uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we say good morning to you, and we ask that you would now be present in in this space, uh, among us, as we open your word today, uh, we thank, thank you, God, for baptisms later on this morning and uh, the new life that you give each of us uh, through the power of your word. And certainly it is not anything magical or mystical, uh, but, but rather it's your, it's your power at work in everyday life that we give you thanks for here today. Uh, God, for this weekend, as the world around us, we celebrate Martin Luther King Day. We do join with those who have gone before us to, to be advocates of, of joy and of justice and of that which you call righteousness. And Lord, for the injustice and the brokenness that's around us, Lord, may you empower us with your Holy Spirit to be your voice and your hands and your presence to bring peace and wholeness to the the lives and the livelihoods of those who live in our neighborhoods and communities, our workplaces and schools here, not just this weekend, but, but for our entire lives, because that's what heaven's going to be like indeed, um, Lord, full of your glory and justice. Um, God, we thank you for your forgiveness and the healing that, that you bring to us spiritually, and we also pray for those who are in need of healing physically today as well, whether it's from colds or aches or, or the pains that we wake up with, or, or maybe there's diseases that we don't even know, uh, certainly incurable diseases that there are folks uh, dealing with and battling. Uh, Lord, we pray for, for the wisdom and, and guidance of doctors and nurses who tend to human care here today. Those who serve in hospice, may you give them uh, an extra measure of compassion and of focus as they walk alongside people in such a, a heartbreaking time. And we do pray for our community today uh, for those who are searching for you. And, and God, we know there are people who are, who are asking questions, who are seeking answers, who are looking for meaning, and, and really the answer to that question, why? why? Why does this happen? And so we ask that your Holy Spirit would be working in their hearts now to point them back to you. Indeed, we just sang that in Christ alone, our hope is found, and it's his power that we pray all these things and the things that are on our hearts and minds today that are left unsaid, we give to you in the mighty name of Jesus who taught us to pray together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Hey, good morning again. And uh, if you came in a little late, I'm Pastor Tim. It's great to be here with you. Our middle school uh, students and some of their adult leaders, they're out in Olympia at a camp, uh, and they are uh, going to be coming back here later today. So keep them in your prayers as well as they travel. And they've spent the weekend down there in God's Word, playing games, getting to know each other, but also digging into what it means to live like Jesus 
this, uh, to love God, to, to love others as they're loved where they live, work, and play. So we're excited to welcome them back to hear uh, what God's been showing them and teaching them here over the last couple of days, all right? So again, keep them in your prayers. And that would not be possible without your faithfulness, uh, your, your time, your talents, as well as your finances to make that possible for all the students, uh, not just on that retreat, but all students. We have a high school retreat coming up here in a couple of weeks. And so if you came prepared to give, to, to love God, love people, and live like Jesus, to see that happen more and more, you can give online, you can give through the app, or you can give in person. There's boxes right in the back. Uh, and if you're a guest with us, hey, Ignore that invitation and just give a connection card here today. On the back of that connection card is an area where you can share a prayer request, and we would be honored to pray with or for you. Let that be your offering here today. You place that card as you leave in one of the boxes in the back. All right? Hey, find a Bible. Find a Bible. They're, they're scattered all around the room. If you brought your own Bible, we are going to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 today. All right? And we'll get there in just a little bit. But as you're turning there, check out... The kids' message. Good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Matt, and I want to welcome everyone to this week's kids' message. Have you ever learned something new? I sure have. And sometimes, it's changed the way that I see myself, the world, and even God. Like for instance, when I learned to surf, I learned how powerful and dangerous big waves can be and to respect the ocean. And when I became a father and saw how I love my kids, I gained a greater understanding of how God loves me. And when I went on a mission trip to Costa Rica, I discovered how God created a diverse world of people who loved and praised God in different ways than I did. In the Bible, people around Jesus always seem to discover something new and they were changed. For example, Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. He was out by the Jordan River baptizing people and preparing the way for the promised Savior. And when Jesus came for John to baptize him, John initially refused, but this was God's plan. He knew that Jesus was God's son sent to rescue the world. John even told his own disciples to leave him and follow Jesus. This reminds me of our bottom line today. When you discover something new, it can change you. God created us with the desire to learn more about the world around us. And we learn something new that's new information that has the potential to impact how we see ourselves, the world, and even God. Let's pray. You can repeat after me. Dear God, you gave me the ability to learn. Help me to keep growing in your truth and in how I see myself, the world, and you. In Jesus' name, amen. For more Bible fun, videos about today's lesson, and conversation starters for your family, head to the section called Kids Connect at Home in today's Kids News email. All right, kids, it's time to head to Kids Connect. So find your leaders in the orange shirts at the back. Have a great week, everybody. Good morning. My name's Tony. I'm one of the elders here at Our Savior Lutheran Church. And our reading today comes from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 10 to 18. And you can find that on page 952 in your pew Bibles. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? 
I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Tony. <clears throat> so I was telling our tech team as I was coming in today that uh, I have no slides. And they're like, what? <laughs> Do you have any pictures? Nope, no pictures. Can we have a sermon? <laughs> I'm thinking, what did we do for the last 2,000 years of, of being in God's Word? And uh, it's not because I'm lazy. It's not because uh, life is, is busy crazy. It's not even because, hey, Matt Keys, if you're watching at home, uh, he, he's home uh, just feeling a little under the weather. And so it, it's not because of any of that. It's because sometimes I think we get so caught up in all the other things, and, and yes, they're gifts, they're blessings, they help us learn, they help us retain knowledge, and, and I don't want to detract from that. But what we're going to discover today is that sometimes we get so distracted by so many of the, the little things around God's Word that we, we I think sometimes, and my fear is that, that a lot of times, I know it is for me, maybe it is for you, that we miss the power of the simplicity of the Word of God. Anyone else feel that sometimes? Just the power and the simplicity of the Word of God. So if you have your Bibles open, we're going to get to work here, all right? If you give me 15 minutes, said no preacher ever. All right, we're going to begin <laughs> in verse 10, all right? Here, we, we have Paul speaking to the church, like you and me, in a place called Corinth. This would have been a letter that is circulated or passed around from house to house, group to group. And, and it, it's not meant to condemn. It's not meant to, to be, be sort of diagnostic. It's meant to tell a story. It's meant to tell a message. It's meant to communicate a simple message that, that, that Jesus is enough, that Jesus alone is enough for you. And right away, we, we have that, that message, laser-focused message there. If you look down with me at verse 10, Paul says, I appeal, I argue, I present before you, brothers and sisters, because you're all bound together in the same family. That, that, that's the nature of, of being baptized into God's family, that, that you are invited, that you are called, that you are named, that you are now not just, just strangers or guests or visitors to God's family, but now you are part of God's family. You are a brother and a sister with Jesus, and you all share the same Father, God the Father himself. So, so Paul's saying, because you're gathered together, because you're part of the same family, that's, that's why I'm I'm sharing with you because you're, you're, you're my brothers and sisters too. And it's only in, in whose name? The Lord Jesus Christ that that's possible. And that's shown by your agreement. That, that in the name of Jesus Christ, all of you have this unity, this togetherness. And so he's saying, don't let there be any divisions among you. Don't, don't let there be any, any divides among you. We'll talk about that in just a second, but that you would be united rather in the same mind and the same judgment. And so, so he makes this, this point of, of having the same mind, the same way of thinking, not, not agreement in everything, but in the way you think in where it starts, that Jesus is the cornerstone and the capstone, the first and the last, that, that Jesus is the point of everything, and, and that is what brings, brings your conclusion, your judgment, your discernment. But we have to talk about that D word, all right? Division. Division. 
Because Paul knows, he's heard, he's seen the division among the brothers and sisters, among the family. Uh, uh, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but how many of us know family division? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we all do. Uh, church division, church family division, how many of us know that? Uh-huh, uh-huh. I, I mean, division in, in a way uh, for, for us as human beings in 2023, it, it's a way of life. It's almost, if you go on to social media, that, that division gets you more likes. Have you ever noticed that? Like, if you cause division, you're liked more than if you cause unity. Like, like if you distinguish yourself from everybody else, somehow it gains in popularity in our culture. And it's just kind of the twisted way of, of our present life. And, and, and the same is happening, honestly, there in Corinth. There's this division. And so where is this division coming from? Well, two things. If you're taking notes, you can jot this down. First is that that there is sin. And that sin is expressing itself in everybody wanting to be right. And I think we would agree today. The division that we experience today goes back to those two points, right? There's sin, and we all want to be right. Each and every one of us. Like, nobody enjoys being wrong, right? Nobody enjoys being on, on the losing end. Nobody enjoys being called out for being incorrect, right? That, that word division, it, it's literally the word schemata, all right? It, it, it sounds like schism because that's what it literally means to be broken or divided, to be segmented, to be shattered, to be torn apart, and if you would have been listening to this, this in, the first, in the first century A.D., you, you would have known that that word specifically within the church would have been used to describe Genesis chapter 3. Because back in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, before you get to chapter 3, you have God's, God's vision, which was not about division. You had God's idea of what the world is and, and what he, his heart desired it to be. So he creates the world, and it was good, and then he creates, creates the sort of crown of his creation, people, you, me, us. He doesn't just say it's good. Some of us, we know what he says. It's very good. If any of us need a, a little self-esteem bo- booster today, Go back and read Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, because God says, you're very good. Not not just good, but you're very good. You see, God had this dream that that you and I, we would be very good. This vision that wasn't division. And and then in Genesis 3, it was like, snap! A bone is broken. That vision is now division. In one act of disobedience, everything is shattered, is schematized, is divided. And so now there's hurt, there's pain, there's meanness, there, there's this, this wanting to be right all the time. And somehow that's become part of our identities that if we're not right, then somehow we are less than very good. That, that now there's, there's, there's this desire to be the best, and to stomp everybody down in, in trying to become the best. There's pain, there's competition, there's lying, there's cheating, there's dishonesty, there's killing, there's injustice, there's even death. Death. And all that, like in a meat grinder, anybody uh, grind sausage before? Like, you know, it, it's kind of gross if you think about it, not the, yeah. <laughs> We lived in Southern Illinois. This is not in my manuscript. We lived in Southern Illinois, and we would have sausage grinding parties. It's what you do in Southern Illinois, and uh, you you take your venison and all all, all your other parts that go into the sausage. Kids, ask your parents what goes into the sausage. And and they would grind it, and I remember this one time, they put the casing on, and and the the grinding was so powerful that it shot the casing up against the wall. It was a mess. It was gross. Uh, But I mean, that's what division does, right? It, it just grinds and grinds, and sometimes it shoots it everywhere, and it makes a mess. It, it's these repeated actions that, that might begin benign, and then eventually it leads us into sin. It's kind of like what the Bible says about money, right? Money in and of itself is not a bad thing. 
It's a gift. But when we love it a little, and a little bit more, and a little bit more, it's the love of money that scripture says is the root of all evil. It's that grind that causes division when it comes to our finances. It's, it's the slow, repeated actions that may begin as benign and innocent that over time then leads us into sin. That's the division that Paul's talking about. And so we see beastly behavior. By the way, that's apocalyptic kind of like end time sort of stuff, scary stuff, like beastly behavior. Uh, anybody see Mean Girls? Yeah, yeah, you remember that scene? Uh, they're, they're looking out on, on the mall area, fountain, and they're like, yeah, this is like high school. And people, they, they begin acting beast-like and like hitting each other and, and like, y- you know, like just how beasts do. And then, and then they devour each other. That's what division does. Whether it's a division of our own hearts between what what my vision is and what God's vision is, what God's plan is and and what my plan is, or or division in our families, or divisions in the church, or divisions about even who Jesus is. That's what happens. We, We become beastly. And so Paul, in a way, is saying, hey, there's divisions among you, and I, I appeal to you. That, that's not how, how Jesus has called you to live. That's not who we live. That's not God's dream. God's vision is not division, but rather it's unity. Stop ripping each other apart with your words. That's the devil's job, not your job. There's enough beastly behavior going around with the devil and, and his demons. You don't need to join in on that. And so what does he encourage us? Rather, not to be divided, but to be united in the same mind or in the same judgment. To be together. So that God's story becomes your story. That God's way becomes your way. That you, me, us, that we see ourselves as, as the apple of God's eye. He is the center of his focus. That, that God, he doesn't want anything more or anything less than you and I to be like peanut butter and jelly. To, to be together like eggs and bacon go together unless you have a heart condition. <laughs> then don't do that. Or like Han and Luke, right? We could go on. All the dynamic duos. Like they, they, they just go together, and, and that, that's God's dream. That's God's vision for you. Not division, but to be unified in him. And Paul knows the story. That's why he uses this word, that everything broke, that it shattered. Anybody have a broken bone before? Yeah, yeah. You break a bone, it hurts. It takes time to heal. Sometimes it gets infected, especially when the bones grind together. But you see, Paul uses this word to united, joined together. It, it, it's interesting because division, if that means uh, this brokenness or shattering, kind of like breaking a bone, then this united word, joined together, means that through Jesus, all things are knit back together, that which is fractured that which is broken, that which needs healing, that which was dislocated is now placed back into place so that you can have the same mind and the same judgment so that you can share the mind of Jesus, so that you can have the judgment of Jesus, so that you can seek the discernment of Jesus. That's what he's saying here in this simple verse. Now, I've only gone for 10 minutes, all right? So I have five minutes left. (laughs) But you see what happens when when we have the unity of Jesus, when we see the unity of Jesus, when we see the work of Jesus. Like Paul is, is, is appealing to the Corinthian Christians, and he's appealing to you and me. This is what happens. When we see the unity of Jesus, it brings light to our deception, it shines a flashlight on the darkness of our own lives. And, and he's, he's giving an example here. He says in verse 12, this is what I mean, that each of you, well, some of you say, I follow Paul, the founder of your church. 
Or some of you, you follow Apollos because he's so charismatic and he's, so, he, he's on social media and he has all these millions of followers and like, 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 and you like what he says and he's winsome. He uses images when he preaches. Or some of you, you say you follow Cephas because he's the first and he's the purest. And, and man, he, he has it right because we can go all the way back to him because he saw Jesus face to face. And even some of you, you, you say you follow Jesus, but, but you use it as a club and a sword, not as, as a bond between each other, like brothers and sisters share in a family. That, that you have all this division, and, and you're deceived because you think that it's, it's about the founder, or you think that it's about the, me, the, the, the way, the methods. Or, or you think it's about, about the, the flash and the show, or you think it's about going back to the, the original roots and, and the first and the purest. Or, or you think it's just about how you live like a moral separatist and like, man, kind of like the Pharisee, like, man, I'm glad I'm not like them <laughs> because I have Jesus and they don't. No, he says you're deceived. If, if you're thinking that way, you're deceived. Jesus is the light that exposes that deception. He's doing it here. He does it with us for who Jesus really is. He's not a club, but he's full of grace and truth. And sometimes grace and truth, it, it does convict. It does hurt. The truth sometimes does hurt. But Jesus always comes to bring life in that hurt. Because seeing Jesus and the unity of Jesus also brings healing to our broken hearts. Brings healing to our broken hearts. Paul talks about how he's thankful that, in verse 14, that he baptized nobody. That, that, that you couldn't twist baptism into thinking that, that baptism is somehow connected to the person who's being baptized or the actions or the moral behaviors or, or the fact that, that he's, the, he's the, the best or the founder or whatever qualifier you put, but rather pointing you back to, to your baptism. It, it's about Jesus and Jesus alone. That if you've been washed in the waters of baptism, it, it's not even about the water itself. It's about the power of God that is spoken over you. And it's about Jesus and Jesus alone. And that's what brings the unity. That's what brings the sameness of mind. That's what brings the clarity of judgment. That's what brings healing to your broken hearts. He says that's the gospel. Verse 17, because Jesus didn't send me just to baptize, but to preach to tell you the gospel, to point you back to Jesus. Not with words of eloquent wisdom like Apollos, not by position like Cephas, Peter, or me, Paul says, lest the cross of Christ be what? What does it say? End of verse 17, help me out. Emptied of its power. Emptied of its work. Lest you say Jesus is not enough. Lest you say that, that you want to replace Jesus with something else, or not even replace Jesus with something else, but add to Jesus' power as if it wasn't enough. And so you see, seeing Jesus in the unity that he brings, right as he begins there in verse 10, it doesn't just bring light to our deception, it just doesn't bring healing to our broken hearts, but it also brings clarity incredible, intense clarity to our priorities, to what matters. It says this, verse 18. For the word of the cross, the message of the cross, the message of this healing, the, the message that in order for there to be a cross, there needs to be a schemata, a, a brokenness. For, for that entire message, it's folly, it's foolishness. It, it, it's, it's, it's literally a rebellion against God. Because think about it, the cross. It is a rebellion against God. It, it, it's saying, God, I'm going to spit in the face of you because, look, there's death. Hang in here. See, see God, you lost. And yet the message that Jesus is hanging on that cross it's a spit in the devil's face. Saying, no, God didn't lose, God won. 
See, that's, that's how it's foolishness. And at the same time, it says, says that it's, it's wisdom. It's, it's power. It's, it's foolishness to those who are dying, those who are dead. But to those of us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Um, John 3, 16. We, many of us know this, right? Help me out. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Anyone know verse 17? For God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Didn't come to to judge the world, but to save the world. Why, why, Why would the gospel of John, why would John say that? Because the world's already condemned. Because you and I, we're already condemned in our sin. Our sin is already judged. It already has a sentence. It already knows where we're going. We had a memorial service here this last week, and uh, whenever we get to host memorial services, um, as a pastor, it's it's honestly just, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, sorry team. As a pastor, it's one of my greatest joys to serve a family in that moment, because we're all going to be there. And I just put myself in, in the shoes of the grieving families. Like, what, what, what would I need to hear if my heart is broken? If there's division in my family over where grandpa or grandma or my son or daughter or my grandson or granddaughter is, what message would I want them to leave with? Would I want them to leave with, with the message of the power of this world? Hey, just live your best life now. Or do I want them to walk out with the power of Jesus that that speaks a better truth than this life, that speaks the power that that there is life beyond this life, that Jesus, he came not to condemn the world because we all know we're going to end up six feet under, but to save us, to redeem us, to give us life both now and forever. That, that, that death, it, it's a symbol of rebellion. It, it, it's the reality of, of that brokenness, that, that schemata that Paul talked about. But, but the truth is, the power of God is that that which is broken can be put back together, that it can be knit back together, that you and I, we are knit back together. Not through anything that we have done, but through what Jesus himself has done. You see, it's the power of God that blows all of that up. It's dynamite, literally, it's dynamite. And because it blows everything up, Jesus is now able to rebuild out of the rubble something beautiful. You see, that's God's vision, which isn't division. Because if you flip through through the chapters of the Bible to the end, that's exactly what he does. Because the world is a mess. You get to Revelation, the world is a mess. You go to Corinth, the world is a mess. People are dying at the stake. People are getting burned alive. Nero Circus is going on. It's a mess. But Jesus, because of the unity you and I have, when we see that unity and we embrace that unity, when we live in that unity, we don't live in schemata. We live together as brothers and sisters. We live together as family. That's the power of Jesus rebuilding the rubble and pieces of our lives and putting it back together. And we all know that's a work in progress. That's where we're going to end today. So let's stand as we close out. The band's going to come up and just a question as you go, just as, as we ask, how, how do we put this all together? And, and it's, probably, it's probably hitting you differently than the person that you came with or, or the person sitting next to you right now or the person sitting across the room if you're online or the person you're going to see tomorrow or later on today. It, like th- this message, it, this is the power of God that it hits us personally as well as communally together. So here's the question. Where's God getting your attention? Where's the division or the schemata between your dream or your vision of life and God's dream or vision of life? And if you are dealing with division, 
If you are dealing with, with that brokenness, maybe it's between you and God. Maybe it's between you and others. Maybe it's between um, just the world and you. Like, like there is brokenness. Maybe today's the day you renew that, that faith and that hope and that trust that even in that schemata, Jesus has the power, not foolish power, but the power to rebuild that unity, that connection, and it's only through him. Keep working at it, family. Jesus' power lives in you. Let's pray. God, um, we hear this word from you. We ask that your Holy Spirit would work in our lives to rebuild us. That where there is division, we acknowledge that that is not of you, that is of the devil, and we pray against that in Jesus' name, that you would bring unity to our relationships, unity to our faith in you, unity with ourselves. So many of us, we, we're living divided lives even among ourselves, and as we do that, maybe deep and hard work, Lord, invite us into the safety and security of your love. Remind us that we are very good, not just good, but very good. That's who you've made us to be. And as we go from this place, as we leave these doors, we ask for your Holy Spirit now to guard and keep us. Give us your wisdom and strength that you would indeed bless us in that way and keep us. Smile on us. Give us your grace, indeed your peace that surpasses even our own human understanding today and always. We ask this in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus. And let God's people all say, amen. amen. Said it, man.